Supriya. So active processes on the molecular scale drive um, dynamic processes on much larger scales, and these are then relevant for cellular function, such as um, cell motility and cell division. Now, in my talk, I will um, discuss theoretical approaches um, to describe how complex dynamics emerges from the interplay of many molecules in such a system. And I will show you several examples where one can, in comparison between experimental theory, use these approaches to understand dynamics in cell biology and cell biophysics. Let me first highlight the dynamics of cells. And you've seen similar example in the previous talk uh, here by two systems that I also uh, discuss again during my talk. First example here is the, the cell motility of a sperm driven by a flagellum. This flagellar structure is inherently an active structure and can spontaneously generate wave-like movements that in a fluid can propel the sperm. Another example to highlight cell dynamics here is a, is, a, is a cultural cell which divides. This was too quick, so I show it again. Um, it's very dynamic. In the, you saw these this ruffles. The cell then rounds up. And in this rounded state, undergoes division. And the two daughter cells live happily afterwards. Now, these examples of um, active and dynamic processes, as well as the examples shown in, in Claire's talk, um, reveal the dynamics of the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton um, is a network of polymer filaments. The main um, two players are the actin filaments and microtubules. They form a network that characterizes the material properties of the cell. It's a gel-like material. Um, but they're also uh, responsible for the dynamic uh, aspects of, of cellular properties and of our active material properties of cells. So while actin filaments um, are sort of more flexible um, filaments, microtubules are rather stiff. Uh, microtubules are in particular involved in the mitotic spindle that physically separates the chromosomes during cell division. The important feature of these filaments is their structural polarity. They have two different ends, you know, the plus and minus end, to distinguish them. And this directionality is important for active processes, as, for example, um, motor proteins that are specialized to generate forces and, and movements um, get a directionality by this structural asymmetry um, of filaments. So the prototype system for molecular force generation in cells um, are highly specialized molecules that directly transduce the chemical energy uh, of a fuel, ATP, which is hydrolyzed. So this triphosphate form is hydrolyzed to the diphosphate form. And this chemical free energy is then used to transduce, um, or is it transduced through directed motion and mechanical work. So the system can carry a load, can generate forces, and can move um, at a certain velocity along a filament. And the direction of motion is set by the structural polarity of the filaments. Now, there are three important families of these motor proteins that interact with the cytoskeleton. I've listed them here. Kinesins and dyneins interact with microtubules and myosins interact with active filaments. And one can characterize the physical and mechanical properties of this active force generation on the level of individual molecules. And I just um, um, show you here an example of experimental data taken for a single kinesin molecule um, moving along a microtubule. And this is done by gluing these molecules to latex beads, small latex beads, which are then manipulated in the, under the microscope in an optical trap. 
um, by observing the speed of the bead motion, one can learn about the velocity of the motor. And um, by applying um, this micro-manipulation using a la focused laser beam, which attracts the bead into the laser focus, one can exert forces that can be calibrated. And with a feedback mechanism, one can keep the force constant while the system moves and then measure the speed as a function of force of a single kinesin molecule. This is going to depend on the fuel concentration. These are data points for two different fuel concentrations. Um, at high fuel concentrations in the millimolar region, the system, uh, in the absence of a force, corresponds to the blue dots, moves about one micrometer per second. It's an external force is, is applied which slows down motion. Um, the speed is reduced and until the velocity reaches zero at the stall force of a few, well, seven picanewton in this case. With a smaller concentration of the fuel, this corresponds to the red data points and the left um, axis here, the system, the system moves much more slowly and also s stalls at a certain stall force. Now, this uh, behavior of a single motor, sort of to a very, uh, very rough approximation to what this behavior is, can be characterized by a roughly linear relationship between velocity and force. So there's a spontaneous velocity in the absence of a force. The force will then reduce the velocity if, it's, if it opposes motion, and there's a characteristic coefficient characterizing the slope. Now, in a, um, the cytoskeleton, a large number of such um, active elements interact with the cytoskeleton and with filaments of the cytoskeleton. And we will be interested in how the mechanical properties on the molecular level then translate into collective behaviors and dynamics in cells. And let me first um, discuss the type of systems can, can be built using these elements and putting them together. So the filaments themselves can be cross-linked, and if these cross-linkers are just passive, holding them together, we have a passive gel-like material, which has certain elastic and viscous properties. Now, m motor molecules interact uh, with these filaments, and they can also, for example, in the form of small aggregates, uh, form cross-links, but active cross-links. So these cross-links are mobile and can slide filaments relative to each other. So that form, we then have something like an active a gel that has active material properties that can be different from um, an ordinary gel. Because filaments are uh, structurally polar, they have a vectorial symmetry. Um, in this gel, filaments can on average point in certain directions, and this is what I call a polar gel. And of course, filaments can also bundle and form stress fibers that are contractile. Um, and uh, uh, exert forces in cells. Now, these are examples of rather dis disorganized cytoskeletal structures that occur in cells, and there are active elements that have mechanical properties driven by these motor proteins that are can be different from what, what simple passive materials would, would exhibit. Cytoskeletal filaments also form a much more complex and highly organized structures, and I just want to here highlight two examples. Um, so these are structures built based on uh, microtubules or actin filaments, but in sort of a beautiful geometrical arrangement. The first one is um, the flagellum um, that drives the motility of sperm. Um, this structure is based on microtubules, and in the cross-section um, you see um, how microtubules are arranged very regularly. So there are pairs, doublets of microtubules um, arranged around a cylindrical configuration. And there are dynamic molecular motors inside generating forces um, and stresses in this cylindrical structure that eventually gives rise to this um, bead-like motion, which I showed you on, my, on the first slide, this wave-like coordinated uh, movements. And we'll, we'll come to this, to this system um, later in my talk. A second beautiful example of uh, highly organized cytoskeletal structures um, are so-called hair bundles. This is shown here in the electron microscope view. 
um, these are the mechanosensory uh, organelles of um, sensory cells of our ears. Uh, this structure is a mechanoelectrical transducer. Uh, these finger-like extensions are filled with actin filaments, the so-called stereocilia. Uh, this structure contains mechanosensitive ion channels, which can open and close when this uh, bundle is slightly deflected, and the influx of ions then gives is rise to, to a, a change in, in, in membrane potential. So very tiny displacements of the structure uh, lead to such an electrical signal. So um, this is a sensitive mechanical sensor. And um, this is also an active structure. Myosin motors are involved um, in the structure and help amplifying mechanical stimuli. Now, a third sort of more highly organized cytoskeletal structure, which I will um, now discuss in, in a bit more detail, um, is the mitotic spindle. Uh, the mitotic spindle, as I mentioned before, um, is a structure that is responsible to physically separate um, the duplicated chromosomes during cell division. Um, it is organized by two asters. In the center, there are two centrosomes. Microtubules polymerize near the centrosomes and radiate out. Um, this structure is dynamically self-organized by a number of sort of uh, molecular interactions. This includes interactions between microtubules and the so-called cell cortex, which is an actin layer um, near the cell membrane. And also, um, microtubules interact with chromosomes, and they also interact with each other. And um, motor proteins play an important role in this self-organization. I want to in particular discuss the role of so-called cortical force generators. Um, very likely these are dynein motors, but probably um, aggregates of some sort that link microtubules to the cortex um, and regulate the behaviors of the mitotic spindle during cell division. Now, the mitotic spindle plays a number of important roles um, as cells divide and as tissues form. And I want to highlight in particular two examples of how the geometry and orientation position of the spindle is essential for organizing patterns in developing tissues and in forming tissues. And this um, sort of organization of the spindle position and orientation um, can be discussed on the basis of how motor proteins act on the spindle. Now, what is the role of the spindle in doing cell division? One important example um, where the spindle determines the fate of daughter cells is so-called asymmetric cell division, where um, an initially symmetric spindle um, somehow moves to an asymmetric position and divides the cell asymmetrically. And as a consequence, the two daughter cells are different and, for example, have different size but also different properties. Now, this process involves displacement of the spindle that is sort of key um, to um, dividing these cells in the, in, the, in, the, in the appropriate way asymmetrically. Another example to highlight the importance of the spindle uh, for the structuring of the, and the arrangement of daughter cells is the orientation of cell division, which um, can lead to different arrangements of cells subsequently. For example, if one cell divides and the two daughter cells divide along the same axis, we get a certain sort of arrangement of cells which results from this particular axis of cell division. If instead these cells would have divided in a particular way, we would have a different arrangement of cells. So when cells divide, they receive um, information from their direct vicinity via adhesion and um, the axis orientation of cell division has to, be has to be controlled and the spindle has to rotate in order to divide properly and generate the right arrangement of cells. I will, will um, discuss in, in the following that cortical motor proteins or cortical force generators interact with the spindle and can achieve these two um, um, controls over cell division by 
um, position the spindle in the right way. Now let's first look at an enzymatic cell division, an important model system to study uh, enzymatic cell division is the very first division of the fertilized egg of this worm, C. elegans, uh, which does divide asymmetrically with cells of two different sizes. And this is the first step in, towards the patterning of this organism. Um, so this um, posterior part will become the tail of the worm and the anterior part of the head, from the, the other way around. Um, and this asymmetric cell division is sort of organized by the cortex, which has two different domains which contain different sets of proteins. And this um, composition of the cortex is then um, um, sort of transmitted to the spindle by inducing a displacement of the spindle. So the spindle um, is sort of pushed towards one side driven by this cortical asymmetry. And then the cleavage of the cell is determined by the microtubules of the spindle. And as the spindle is positioned asymmetrically, cleavage is asymmetrically, and two different cells result from that. Now, if you look at this process, and this is a, a movie with a market mark of microtubules, um, one can see this displacement occurring so the, this was the original point where the spindle pole was. This is the final point. And we have this displacement here. And there's a very, very interesting phenomenon occurring during this process that gives a lot of information about the organization uh, of the underlying um, interactions. That is the fact that, that, I should go back to show this again, that the spindle pole shakes up and down and generates oscillatory movements. Now, these spindle oscillations um, are very interesting because they raise the question, what are the mechanics of the system, and what is the reason that oscillations occur, and can we learn from these oscillations um, about sort of the force balances of the system and how this, how this whole process is, is organized? Now, the basic idea here is that cortical force generators pull on microtubules. These are force generators that want to move towards the minus end of microtubules. They interact and they pull. And as the cortex is asymmetric, uh, there can be a different number of active motors on one side as compared to the other side. And the net force um, displaces the spindle. Now, how can this scenario give rise to oscillations? Um, in order to study that, let's look at the simple physical description of this process and we, we will focus on the axis along which oscillations occur. So I will just use a simple one-dimensional description. Um, we have microtubules radiating out um, along this direction. They can bind to force generators that pull on microtubules and there are a number, number of other microtubules uh, which do not interact with such force generators and they will essentially lead to pushing forces. They, will, can, they can buckle, and this gives rise to some restoring force. So we can describe that um, by looking at the equation for the position of the spindle pole. There is a restoring force, which is characterized by an elastic coefficient, which somehow um, results from the centering mechanism or from microtubule buckling. There is some effective friction for moving the spindle pole around the cell. And then there are the forces of the left and, and right um, populations of force generators that, that pull. Now, it's important to note that this system is completely overdamped. So inertial forces can be neglected as compared to all friction forces. And we have the simple overdamped dynamics. So where can oscillations arise in such a system? Now, um, in order to discuss possible mechanisms for oscillations, um, we have to look at cooperative behavior, in particular of force generators in such a system. So if the number of force generators that act at the same time is sufficiently large, we can get collective behaviors. Um, and um, this implies that the mechanical properties 
of a many motor system uh, working against an external force can look different from what a single motor would do and if you just scale up a single body behavior to many motors. So this, this, this ordinary behavior, which we know from single motors, corresponds to this blue curve, a relationship between velocity and force that is sort of monotonous. Now one can show in quite generally that active systems that work together, active molecules that generate forces together, because of their mechanical interactions can give rise to dynamic instabilities which then are represented by a nonlinear force velocity curve. Um, and somewhere in between is a, is, a, is a critical point. So this is reminiscent of phase transitions in ordinary matter. And this looks like a first order phase transition which can emerge if the number of molecules interact is very large. Now we can, can um, sort of give you a bit more intuitive interpretation of such a nonlinear force velocity curve. Um, if you think of a bead coated with a large number of individual motor proteins which like to walk individually on the filament, they are linked by an elastic linker for the bead. Um, and we assume that each of them has a simple linear force velocity relationship, as I indicated before. The only other physical ingredient which we have to also take into account is the probability of detachment and reattachment of individual motors, which are all glued to the speed. Now, on general physical grounds, we know that detachment rate um, of such a motor depends on the force it feels, which is given by the extension of this elastic linker. Now, if you can put these motors together and we increase the force, there can be a sort of a catastrophic rupture event, um, which is a situation where motors detach and the remaining motors feel an increased force per motor because they all have to share with a small number of motors the same load force. And then as they feel a larger force individually, their detachment rate goes up. And this can give rise to such a collective rupture event and a force velocity curve which becomes highly nonlinear just because of cooperativity of these force generators. Now if we take into account the fact that many force generators working together can, can show such a, such a rupture transition in their force velocity relationship, um, we can now look at what happens if motors operate antagonistically. Antagonistic motors are motors that work like in a tug of war against each other. And that's exactly the situation that we have um, in these force generators that pull from both sides um, on the spindle. Um, if you have antagonistic motors, it means that in the same reference frame, the force velocity relationship of the motors on both sides are just mirror images of each other. So I assume for each side, uh, we have a collection of motors which have this cooperative rupture phenomenon in their and the nonlinear force velocity relationship. And now we can connect them together mechanically. Now we have really worked them, we allow them to work against each other. And the overall force velocity relationship of this antagonistically acting system can be generated by adding forces at the same velocity of these two force velocity curves. So we look at a given velocity and we add the forces. And then we get a curve uh, that can be look very different from ordinary force velocity curves. Um, it has the feature in this case where both sides are exactly equal that the system um, has two competing states. It can either move in one, one direction, so one side moves and wins and the other side detaches, or this side moves and wins and this side detaches. This corresponds to these two um, um, states that coexist. And in, in many cases, the non-moving states where the two sides just pull on each other and the system does not move, is unstable, it doesn't really occur. So just all, one side always wins. Now this is a very non-linear force velocity relationship, which is, which is um, characteristic for the, which, which results from these interactions of motors. And if we take such a system, as I mentioned, it can move in either direction, so it's a bidirectional system. And if it is added with a restoring force, like the centering mechanism I mentioned before, this will become a nonlinear oscillator. So, this is described um, by an oscillator equation. Uh, this nonlinear term comes from this 
collective effects in the in the force velocity curve, um, and we can sort of derive all these terms and relate them to properties of the motor proteins involved. So we can starting from the physical properties and the force velocity curves of individual motor proteins um, determine uh, these these different coefficients uh, of this oscillator. Now one can um, sort of write down this, this theory for the case of the of the metallic spindle and ask under what conditions uh, would the spindle be stable, not oscillate, or would oscillate spontaneously. And we can con quantitatively compare the observed spindle oscillations to the um, oscillations found in this description. There are two parameters um, that we do not know from single molecule experiments and that the cell can probably regulate. Uh, one important parameter that is varying by the cell is the number of force generators that acts uh, on each side. And then uh, one parameter is the uh, fraction of force generators that, that at any moment are, are bound to microtubules. Now, this, um, the observed oscillations, they correspond to some point in the state diagram on the oscillatory side. And one can see that if there is a minimum number of force generators active, the system just becomes unstable. So these antagonistic motors which work against each other uh, lead to a situation where spontaneous oscillations occur. Um, and this is unavoidable if the number of force generators that is active exceeds a certain threshold. Now one can test such, such ideas as to whether this physical picture applies to the biological system. And uh, in the case of this um, fertilized egg of the, of the worm, there are powerful methods to manipulate uh, molecular players in the system. In particular, RNA interference permits to specifically um, reduce the number of certain, uh, certain molecules. And um, so our colleagues in Dresden have done an experiment um, reducing the number of, of a molecule which activates force generators. In the, in the cell cortex. And um, as, so it, reducing the number of force generators, one would expect that when it leaves this oscillating regime and oscillations could stop. And here you see experimental data. Um, one axis corresponds to um, the number of force generators which goes down along this axis. So each data point is a laid egg of a worm uh, in which it was observed by what distance the spindle was displaced and by what amplitude oscillations did occur. And uh, different eggs had different levels of this, of this molecule and different levels of active force generators. Now, because the number of force generators is, generators is reduced, overall the displacement distance of the spindle is, goes down. So this just shows a gradual loss of force generators that pull the spindle to one side. And we also see that the oscillation amplitude suddenly stops as we cross this instability line and stays zero there. So this shows there's a real dynamic instability between an oscillating and non-oscillating state in the system that is passed. So the... Um, main variable is the position of the center of the spindle. And then there are many force generators which pull on different, different filaments. And the cooperativity is sort of in these force generators. And they all pull on the same spindle pole. So the coupling comes via the mechanics of the spindle. And it synchronizes them as well. Now, this was an example about spindle displacement and asymmetric cell division. Um, I'd like now to discuss um, spindle orientation and want to show that also the same force generators that pull the spindle to the side, the cortical force generators, are involved in spindle rotation and in spindle orientation. And this can be studied in a particular experimental situation. Um, the idea is that spindle orientation is somehow influenced by the, the direct adhesive environment of a cell. And somehow this information goes um, to the spindle which then orients in a particular way. 
And this can be studied, and it's studied in the group of Michel Bonas at Paris by using adhesive micro patterns on, on which cultured cells adhere, and then observing cell division on these um, adhesive micro patterns which have different geometries. And the question then is how does the orientation of cell division depend on the pattern geometry? Now, this is an example of such an experiment. So, the red outline here, which is hard to see, is an L shaped adhesive pattern. Um, this is, is a um, fluorescent marker that shows the centrioles, which you also see here, and here you see the little cell. And so, the, the initial cell sits on this pattern, it rounds up to divide, you see the axis, and now you have to do tortoise cells. And we can already see here that somehow the cell division axis was, was symmetric with respect to this pattern shape. The question is how does the, the spindle turned in the right orientation um, using clues from the adhesive environment. Now before the cell divides, before it rounds up, um, it has formed adhesion sites on the substrate. And these adhesion sites are kept even during division. The cell then, as it reaches um, division, the cortex contracts, it forms a spherical shape, which is shown here, and the connections to the adhesion sites that were formed before remain, and there are these tube-like structures um, that connect the adhesion sites um, to the cell, cell body. These are called re retraction fibers. Now, the idea is that these retraction fibers, which, which connect to the cortex here, provide some cues on the cortex about the position of the geometry of adhesion sites around the cell. And that um, now this cortical um, cues, the cortex now has some inhomogeneity, which then can activate cortical force generators in inhomogeneous ways. Now, here these blue dots now represent the cortical force generators. And let's assume that whenever there are retraction fibers um, informing about an adhesion site nearby, these cortical force generators will become active. And when there is no retraction fibers, these cortical force generators are not active. The cortical force generators, as before, they pull on spindle microtubules. And because of the geometry of the spindle, they will exert torques. So the force that is generated by these force generators acting on microtubules is tangential to the microtubule. And we, let's assume for simplicity that the microtubules radiate out with equal, equal sort of with equal anchorial distribution around one pole. We now have an inhomogeneous distribution of force generators. We can ask what is the torque exerted on the structure. And remember the whole cell has rounded up as a spherical geometry. So the spindle can rotate quite easily in the, within this sphere. And such force generators can just can just um, turn it in the right way. So we can calculate. So what, what we are doing is um, uh, we know the shape of the, of the pattern, and we know from experiments that the retraction fiber somehow find the outer outline of this pattern shape. We can then calculate the distribution of reject, retraction fibers um, coming to the, to the cell surface, and the retraction fibers emerge radially. So we somehow have an idea of what is the distribution of force generators that are active on this spherical outline. Um, knowing this force distribution, we can calculate the torque. And the torque is a function then of, of the uh, rotation angle, orientation angle of the spindle with respect to some reference axis. Now from the torque, we can define something like an angular potential. The idea is that the derivative of this potential with respect to the angle will give us the torque. And if we also take into account that there are fluctuations in the system, um, that the spindle is not moving deterministically, but there are also random forces, um, with the most simple choice of random forces, one gets a steady state distribution function of the spindle, probability to find a certain orientation, which depends then on this, this potential and some parameter, which is the noise strength in the problem. And with this, with this approach, uh, one can, in fact, um, um, predict the distribution functions of angles that are observed experimentally for many different pattern shapes, and just show you a few examples. So these micro patterns can be copied in large numbers on, on a substrate, so one can observe many cells dividing um, at the same time. This is a very efficient procedure. And then get quite good statistics of the orientation angles of cell division. So that the red dots are measured uh, histograms of angles that are observed on such a, such a setting. 
and the blue curves are then the fit of this calculated probability distribution for a given pattern shape. And as a, this, this simple description of this, just using the idea that activated force generators pull on microtubules um, and turn um, the spindle uh, can, can account for all the observed um, distribution functions on various different patterns. And here you see two examples and, and, and two fits um, with one single fit parameter, which is the noise strength um, to this data. And these are two other examples. And there are many more, and I, I, can, I do not want to show you all of them. So the um, conclusion here is that with a very simple idea of how force generators in the cortex, the full-on spindle microtubules, are activated by retraction fibers that indicate the um, adhesive environment, one can quantitatively account uh, for how spindles orient in these um, cultured cells. Now, in the last part of my talk, I want to come back um, to flagella. These are a beautiful example of how many tiny motors together generate complex spatio-temporal dynamics. And I've already uh, explained the structure. Um, these axonemal structures are very conserved and common in general in eukaryotic cells. So they exist um, in single cell cell organisms such as paramecium or chlamydomolas or um, also in higher organisms. They are responsible for the propulsion of many sperm. Um, so they can generate a swing of cells, but they also stir fluids. And um, many cells such as um, um, the epithelial cells of our airways have a large number of such um, flagella or cilia um, that beat in concert and generate um, collectively waves that's, that move fluid. These um, flagella and cilia structures are also involved in many sensory systems. For example, insect mechanosensors are really based on such axonal structures. Olfactory neurons um, um, have their um, chemosensitive re receptors on the surface of cilia. And also sperm, when they swim, um, they steer by using sensory um, systems that are um, related to, to olfactory senses. Now let's look um, at the, sort of the physics of the cilia bead. Um, this is, a, again, the movie taking slow motion of a 50 hertz beating sperm um, measured by Ingmar Riedel in Joe Howard's lab. Um, and the question here again is how do many uh, motors together generate oscillations? And I've already shown you one, one, one answer to that question. And I want to show you, um, argue here that a similar mechanism of basic co cooperative motors can also sort of account quantitatively for the sperm beat. Because again, we're having a situation um, where we can use the idea of antagonistic motors working against each other. If you look at in this, in this, this structure of dynamic motors sliding microtubules relative to each other in this, in this cilium, um, this can lead to, to bending. And um, if, if you just use it as a simplified two-dimensional description, as indicated here, let's assume that overall sliding of microtubules is prevented by some structural elements then if motors induce relative sliding, they will induce bending. And if motors do that on one side, because their activity will lead to bending in one direction, and motors on the opposite side, they will drive bending in the opposite direction. So we have, again, antagonistic motors working against each other. And now uh, we have the same oscillation mechanism at hand that I explained before, except that now we have motors distributed along the whole length of the axon. So we have lots of these nonlinear oscillators coupled together. And uh, this can be sort of uh, quite concisely discussed in a two-dimensional picture where we sort of project the whole axonal structure on a, on a plane and just think of it as a, as a structure that, that bends in a plane because the sperm bead is planar. Um, and uh, so by assuming a planar bead, we, we can directly live in, in, in two dimensions. And then describe this shape of the um, flagellum in two dimensions um, by defining the angle of the tangent with respect to the horizontal 
as a function of the arc length measures from the front to some position. And then r sort of take like the dynamics of this, this um, angular uh, profile describing the, 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 the shape. And um, by looking at the physics of bending filaments, um, we can first write a dynamic equation for this shape, um, which involves some friction with the environment, the bending elasticity um, of the, all the microtubules on the system, and some driving forces that induce shape changes that come from the motor. So F is the local force density that the dynamic dining motors generate at some position S in the cross-section of the cilia. Now this motor force um, is now related to motor displacements by the same rules that I described before. The cooperative behavior of motors gives rise to these nonlinear terms and we have these oscillator-like like equations. So we can now use this representation to describe the coupled mechanical oscillator generated by all the dining motors along the structure. So this, this is sort of the uh, time Fourier representation of the shape evolution. And taking into account these um, properties of the motors to form themselves an oscillator um, introduces a new term which contains all these motor properties that are related to this oscillator equation. Um, that I introduced earlier. Now, by solving sort of this wave equation um, for, the, for the flagellar beat, we can compare it to experimental measured beats. So using a high-speed video camera, um, our colleagues measure the sperm beat and calculate the shape as a function of, of measure the shape as a function of time, and measure in particular this Fourier mode, the, the, this is the Fourier amplitude of the dynamic shape changes at some B frequency omega. Now this Fourier ampli amplitude characterizes the whole waveform of the sperm beat. And it is a complex number, so we can characterize by a real part and an imaginary part. And this compares now the experimentally measured sperm beat in blue and the, um, sort of the closest calculated one is shown in red. And by comparing um, sort of experiment here, we can now measure these parameters that enter the equation, some of which we already know, for example, the friction coefficient with the surrounding fluid we, one can estimate and measure. Um, one also finds the appropriate value for the bending rigidity of all the microtubules involved. And one gets um, a value for this coefficient, chi, which characterizes the dynamic um, mechanical properties of the motors inside this, this uh, psyllium, and which can be related and compared to of how uh, a certain number of individual motor proteins would operate dynamically at, such, at, at, at a beat frequency. By using this comparison, we also learn quite a bit about boundary conditions in particular, but what are the, sort of the nature of the links that keep microtubules together near the front, near this basal structure where the head of the sperm is? And um, interpreting these experimental data, we find that there is a quite significant movement going on in the front. And one can understand this, this experimental data only by assuming that there is about um, a movement of the amplitude of more than 100 nanometers. Um, and there are some elastic elements linking the head structure together. I should also mention that with this approach, uh, we can also exclude other alternative me physical mechanisms as they would not give rise to the observed shapes of the beat. One can use the same approaches also to try to tackle three-dimensional beats. This is then mathematically more involved because we have to take into account twists and bends motion. But in the case of taking into account the full three-dimensional geometry of the cilia, um, in particular, if we look at situations where there's no constraint that tries to keep the system beating in the plane, it will generally now generate waves that are more, rotator, more rotating waves. And the sense of rotation of these movements um, is determined by the structural um, properties of this um, axonemal cross-section in the cilium. So you see that microtubules and dynamic motors form a structure that has a sense, a rotation sense. So it's a chiral structure, 
by construction. And because it is chiral, a three-dimensional wave pattern will also be chiral. And so the, the rotation in one direction is um, privileged over the opposite sense rotation. And so that in the uh, last minute, let me just show you an example of such a rotatory movement um, in, in cells. There are cilia that actually beat um, by rotating. And then these, these are um, shown here. And they all beat in the same uh, rotational sense. And they play an important role during the development of higher organisms. This is um, observed in mouse embryos. And the cilia you see here are important in setting up the right symmetry breaking of the mouse embryo with respect to left-right asymmetry. So the left-right asymmetry assures that the heart will be sitting on the left side of the developing organism uh, and not on the right side. And this symmetry breaking is controlled by the um, sense of rotation of these beating cilia on the surface of the embryo. This generates then a hydrodynamic flow that is asymmetric because of the chiral nature of, of rotation. And presumably, this asymmetric flow leads to distributions of signaling molecules, which then set up the fate of, of cells in the embryo to develop differently on the left and on the right side. So with these examples um, come to the end of my talk. I like to acknowledge um, my co-workers. Many people have contributed to the um, works I've described and many other projects I didn't have time to describe today. Um, I'd like to mention, in particular, to mention Jacques Pro, with whom we started um, more than 10 years ago to look at cooperative behaviors of force generators. Um, the work on asymmetric cell damage was done in collaboration with Joe Howard, Tony Heimann, and Stefan Grill. Uh, Stefan Grill um, did both experiments and theory and worked at both institutes in Dresden. So our colleagues work at the Institute for Molecular Cell Biology, and I myself am at the Institute for Physics of Complex Systems. Um, also, Carsten Kruse was, was involved in these projects. Uh, the work on um, the orientation of the cell division axis is the collaboration with Michel Bonas, Manuel Thierry. And uh, the work on the sperm bead uh, is a collaboration with a group of Joe Howard and his students, Ingmar Riedel and um, Andreas Hilfinger. And um, with that, I thank you for your attention. So the retraction fibers um, it exist in these cultures and are somehow a, a sort of a consequence of having a substrate on which you adhere. And um, they are membrane tubes filled with actin and some other proteins. And there are some actin-associated proteins which accumulate at the point where the retraction fiber meets the cortex. And so there is a certain protein markers that then are distributed unevenly around the rim of the cell cortex and in a way that is um, correlated with wh whether there are retraction fibers or not. So the, the, um, the force generators I mentioned are probably um, dynein, dynactin complexes and they are there. Uh, they are everywhere, they're everywhere. And the idea now is that they are regulated. So as in the case of the spindle uh, displacement I showed before, there it is a particular signaling system. If it is activated, these motors become active. They're, they're, they're everywhere, but they are active only when, when activated. And in the case of the spindle orientation, we think that such an activation happens via some molecules that accumulate as a consequence of retraction fibers being there. In the case of the orientation, it's not related to PARs, not related to PAR proteins. But it's, um, so there, there we don't know what the signaling system is.
that we just see that there's a clear correlation between, of course, from the analysis of the theoretical analysis, we see that if, if force generators were exactly activated in this pattern, it would exactly give this distribution. So we have a very strong idea that motors are regulated in a differential manner. And then we see that there are correlations between certain cytoskeletal proteins um, so that there's that there are cues set up by these retraction fibers. But we do not know which signaling system then triggers the motor. In the case of the spinal displacement in the C elegans, then we know what signaling system, system does it because it can be directly manipulated and, and you see the consequence of losing the motor. But the motors, I think, are there all the time and they get activated and deactivated by signaling systems. Are charged. Um, so the motor proteins certainly contain some charged groups, and then there are, of course, counter ions. And with the physiological concentrations of ions and salt in the system, you have a very, very um, short screening length. So, from a, if you just look at the molecule from a very short distance away, it doesn't look charged. So I would rather think it's not, not charged. They are not repelling each other, but the screen length is very, very small. So of course, SKD get close, they may, they may interact by various interactions. Um, but L electrostatics is only appearing at extremely short distances. The interaction between motors and the actin filaments involves a number of physical interactions. There's Van der Waal inter inter interactions. Um, and then, of course, the, there's a very specific type of interaction um, where the two protein surfaces really meet. And their electrostatics play the role. Um, but it's also very, very specific in the sense that the uh, local folding of the protein structure matches the surface of the actin filaments in various ways. And there may also be a local refolding when, when, they, when they make that. So my, my perspective is that these interactions are very complex because many atoms contribute to this interaction. And the electrostatics is certainly involved. Okay, thank you very much.